All right, so let's talk about these two Lee Young Lee poems. One of my favorite poets, for sure, um, because when I had uh, started uh, writing poetry and, uh, and getting my master's, I had gone with a very specific idea of poetry being powerful, for sure, but also political and social and uh, a little too didactic. Uh, and my mentor at the time introduced me to Leon Lee's book of poetry and said, this is what poetry is, and I get it. And this poem... Um, titled Out of Hiding is, in my opinion, one of the best examples of why poetry is amazing. So let's look at this poem. Very simple words, right? Not difficult to understand, but profound in its meaning. Someone said my name in the garden while I grew smaller in the spreading shadow of the peonies, grew larger by my absence to another, grew older among the ants ancient. When I heard my name again, it sounded far, like the name of the child next door, or a favorite cousin visiting for the summer, while the quiet seemed my true name, a near and inaudible singing, born of hidden ground. Quiet to quiet, I called back, and the birds declared my whereabouts all morning. So it seems very simple and it seems like what could possibly be going on here? I don't get it. There's really not many clues. This is a poem that's a great example also of illusions, right? I spoke to you about A-L-L-U-S-I-N-O-S. Illusions are references to anything outside the poem. It could be references to the Bible, to history, to other pieces of literature, to time periods. Um, so there are illusions here. The first reference here is garden, okay? And in this garden is where all of this is happening. The poem is happening in the garden. Someone said my name in the garden. And his reaction to his name, the speaker's reaction to this name is shocking. The, his reaction to the name is, is many. First, he grows smaller. Then he grows larger. Then he grows older. And then he hears the name again. And this time it sounds very far and distant. It doesn't sound like his name anymore. It sounds like the name of someone who grew up in his neighborhood or someone in his family. And then he's thinking about his name and he's saying, well, wait a minute, I think the quiet, the actual silence is my true name, the name of me. And then he describes the silence as actually some kind of singing that is close to him, but it's inaudible. You can't hear it. So imagine something like a vibration, like a humming. And here's another illusion, a reference to hidden ground, born of hidden ground. And the third reference to the same um, the third reference to the same text that's referring to quiet to quiet. So, uh, and birds, what he's really referencing here is, is your professor, I'll give you a shortcut is the Bible. Um, he's referencing the garden of Eden and he is referencing, um, Adam born of hidden ground. Then he's referencing the, um, the scripture that recalls deep to the, the deep calls to the deep. And here he's reiterating that idea of quiet to quiet, he's calling back. And then of course, birds, as we know, are very important in scripture. They are the messengers of God. Very often we see them. And the birds, these messengers, knew where he was the whole morning. And if you look at the title, this is a one where the title is really important, Out of Hiding is the title of this poem. And he's out of hiding when the whole poem, what he's doing is he's hiding. Someone calls his name and he shirks, he grows small, he's hiding. Then he grows larger to hide. Then he grows older to hide. And then when he hears his name again, he says, wait a minute, is that really my name? No, it doesn't sound like my name. It sounds like something else. And I actually think that this whole time, the quiet, the silence is my true name. And I'm calling back to this silence, born of hidden ground. This Adam is calling back to his maker, to his creator, to God. And guess who knew where he was all morning? God. The birds declared his whereabouts all morning. It also talks about the fact that in scripture there is reference to uh, when we uh, meet our maker, uh, we will have another name in heaven uh, other than the name that we have here on earth. So all of this is in a reference to God. Now, if you think about who he's hiding from, he was hiding from God. Was he hiding from man? Was he hiding from all of the things that a name can mean to us, right? A name, just think about your name. A name can um, give hints to gender, to culture, to religion, to age, to familial ties. 
Um, you know, a, a name is so much, so much so that if you were walking in a foreign country and someone just said your name, uh, even though you know you don't know anybody there, you would turn around and say, hey, who's calling my name? And so this reaction to a name is similar to our reaction. Would we hide? Would we grow small? Would we grow big? Would we grow absent? Right. So just a beautiful, beautiful poem about him realizing who he really is, that he cannot hide from his maker. He cannot hide from God. In fact, he's fine with having the name that God gives him. And he, that's who he's worried about. The quiet, the silence, that inaudible singing, a prayer. Right. That that thing that's happening that nobody knows is happening, um, but is very real. In fact, maybe more real than all the other things that are happening. So beautiful, beautiful, beautiful poem. Now, the other one here, The City in Which I Loved You, is much, much longer, very different uh, in style from the other one, where Lee Young Lee was very, uh, very simple and just clearly imagery with the simple of the, this person in the garden uh, changing form uh, in reaction to someone calling his or her name. Here we have a very sprawling, lovely, full multitude of words uh, in this poem. So I want you to read this poem and I want you to be overcome by it. I want you to read it out loud because if you read it out loud, it will just, it's just really what poetry is about. You know, uh, I'll just start it for you a little bit. Um, and when in the city in which I love you, even my most excellent song goes unanswered and mount the scabbed streets, the long shouts of avenues and tunnels sunk in night in search of you. So there's this you. And so every time we have a poem where there's some kind of an address to a you, we always wonder, is it us? Is it the reader? Is there some specific person who's the addressee here? Continuing on, rain rhyming like teeth into the beggar's tin, or two men jackling a third in some alley, weirdly lit by a couch on fire that I drag my extinction in search of you. So he's describing all of these different chaotic scenes from the city that he's in, past the guarded schoolyards, the boarded up churches, swastika synagogues, defended houses of worship, past newspapered windows of tenements along the violated, prosecuted citizenry throughout this storied, buttress, scavenged, policed city I call home in which I am a guest. It's just so beautiful. I think that um, especially as a love poem, when you see what we were talking about with Gwendolyn Brooks and how she gives this immense feeling of being overcome and then the absence, we, we reach this here about halfway through Lee Young Lee and the speaker in this poem now uh, talk about this absence and this death and this desecration. Um, you know, he's speaking to no finger touches me secretly, no mouth tastes my flawless salt, no one wakens the honey in the cells, finds the humming in the ribs, the rich business in the recesses, hulls clogged, I continue laden, translated by exhaustion and time's appetite, my sleep abandoned, and just, just lush, sprawling, lovely, read it out loud and just feel the power of these words and the, the mixture and the order of words just really take over you. It's political, it's, it's philosophical, it's theological. And the reference, the person who he's looking for is God. Again, the city in which I love you. And I never believed that the multitude of dreams and many words were in vain, that there is purpose to life. That is the you he is addressing. Read it with that in mind. And I guarantee you uh, that you'll